all these readings today. It's a lot of reading. Kind of feels like a, a scriptural bonanza. There's a lot going on here. If you've ever wondered how we at Trinity pick the readings for Sunday mornings, well, we don't. The Episcopal Church, along with many other liturgical churches, follows the Revised Common Lectionary. The scripture readings are assigned. So today, we get the anointing of the great King David, a beloved 23rd Psalm, a thankfully short snippet of a letter to the Ephesians, and then this long, dramatic story of Jesus healing a man born with blindness. So there are some overarching themes here, right, of light and sight. In the Hebrew scripture reading, Samuel has been told by God to anoint a king. Samuel don't, doesn't know who it will be. He keeps questioning until finally God shows him, helps him to see that it is David. And the epistle reading is all about light, making things seen and us living in the light of Christ. Then we have this dramatic story of Jesus healing a man born with blindness in which we hear Jesus say, and not for the first time, that he is the light of the world. And then right off the bat, first verse of this gospel, we're hit with this blind versus seeing issue. First of all, Jesus sees the man. And then the disciples' first question is, why is he blind? Whose fault is it? And Jesus basically tells them that they are blind to the truth of the situation, that they are missing the point. And then Jesus heals the man using mud made by spitting on the ground. And that act, it's reminiscent of creation, right? When God formed humankind from the dust of the ground. And when the man washes the mud from his eyes, he can see. I've often wondered about this part of the story. This man had never had sight. His brain had never processed light into images. Then all of a sudden, light and color are flooding his neural pathways. How can he make sense of it? But his physical sense of sight isn't really the point of the story, is it? So now this man, born with blindness, can see. And we get this whole series of events with the Pharisees trying to figure out what happened. What really happened? Because Jesus performed this healing act on the Sabbath. And that was against the rules. And only a sinner would break the rules. But a sinner could not have opened this man's eyes. And yet, here is the man. He was blind, and now he sees. So after much back and forth, some repeated questioning, even contacting the man's parents, finally, the man says, here is an astonishing thing. I love that verse. Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. I wonder if the astonishing thing the man is referring to is that Jesus opened his eyes. Or is it that the Pharisees doubt the whole episode because they just can't or don't want to believe that it could have happened at all? I have to admit I have some amount of sympathy for the Pharisees here because it's hard to know what to believe sometimes. 
Right now, we live in a time where we can't even trust what we see or hear all the time. Photos are doctored. Audio can be tampered with. We hear conflicting stories in our media. Authority figures admit to lying, and we just don't know who or what to believe much of the time. What is real? What is true? Well, the man in this story, he knows what happened to him. He knows he's been changed. He's been transformed. At the beginning of the story, he was an outcast, a beggar, prevented from participating in society. Then Jesus heals him, and he's briefly no longer an outcast. He's included. Until he argues with the authorities, and they throw him out of the synagogue. And now he's an outcast once again. Except that Jesus, through this healing, has seen and called this man, called him to be a follower. And the man's response is simply, I believe. The important transformation in this man didn't happen in his eyes. It happened in his heart. His heart was opened to the truth. So the story continues on. We didn't even hear it all today. Jesus continues talking, and there's a long passage where he talks about the sheep and the sheepfold. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and they know me. This man who was born with blindness was called by the good shepherd and welcomed into the sheepfold. Today, our children, who are now in the basement in godly play, they're hearing this story too, in a slightly different way. It's one of the lessons in our series for Lent, goes through Jesus' life. And the lesson today comes after the lesson about Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, where he went to learn more about who he really was and what his work was going to be. Here's the image that we use for this lesson. You can see Jesus touching someone's eyes. And the lesson includes these words. Jesus came back across the River Jordan, began to do his work. But what was his work? Jesus' work was to come close to people, especially the people no one else wanted to come close to. Here, he's come so close to this person that he's touching their eyes. When Jesus came close to people, they changed. They could see things they could never see before. They could do things they could never do before. They were made well. They were made well. Several years ago, I was at the closing worship service of a conference. It was a conference centered around the work of Christian formation with children. And most of the attendees were women because in the larger church, this is still largely the work of women. So this Eucharist took place in an, a large hotel meeting room. A table had been set up for the Eucharist. But otherwise, it was a pretty nondescript, generic setting. I'm sitting in this room, surrounded by women, and all of the worship leaders at this service were women. All of the voices 
that we heard were female. It's a beautifully thought out liturgy. And when the officiant began the Eucharistic prayer for communion, it was different. It wasn't one that I was familiar with. And this is an ecumenical gathering, so that wasn't surprising, but it made me listen closely to the words. The language of this prayer was overwhelmingly feminine. Aside from Jesus, of course, all references to people were to women. We heard God described in terms that are traditionally feminine. And I don't remember the exact wording, but I do remember the experience. I remember how I felt. And when I went up to receive communion, and that wafer was placed in my hand, it was, I think, the first time in my life that I felt like this sacrament was for me. In all of my softness, in my femininity, in my female body, this was Jesus, and it was for me. And in that moment, my heart was opened, and I saw in a new way my own belovedness in God. It was a small moment of healing, and I was transformed. And I think that's what the man at the center of this story we heard today experienced. I think he experienced that belovedness. And that was enough for him to say, I believe. His heart was open to the truth. And he saw the good shepherd. Today's psalm was most likely familiar to this man, and I can imagine those words flowing from his mouth. God is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell with God forever. Amen. Amen.